um, distinguished panelists and distinguished participants, good morning. Welcome to join us for this session, a new era for collective action, regulatory and normative approaches. So just now, Peter and Julia emphasized, among others, the devastating uh, effect of corruption to economics, societies, and individuals. We all acknowledge that um, as a very complex and pervasive issue, corruption cannot be addressed by a single uh, stakeholder or one government alone. So it's crucial for the public sector, private sector, civil societies, and academia to join forces to combat uh, corruption. So in a very uni unified and subjective manner. So that is in what we refer to as collective action. So in practice, what is the public sector is doing to enhance collective action? Together with our distinguished panelists today, we will discuss the uh, institutionalization of platforms for the engagement of private sector, the role or the use of the collective action to engage private sector in addressing corruption, and the role of the tone from top in fostering collective action. So this uh, will all tie to the agenda of the discussion that aims to look into the role and the impact of the uh, public sector in supporting and participating in collective action. Now I am honored to introduce our distinguished panelists. So first uh, from Ms. Uh, Isabel Riguzo. She is the director of the French Anti-Corruption Agency. Prior to this post, Isabel has a number of interministerial positions, uh, as well as prosecution and European uh, responsibilities, such as the representation of the European Commission in France. She has rich experience in international judicial cooperation, anti-corruption, and anti-fraud. So our next one for the gender balance. Mm. So I will introduce our next uh, panelist is Mr. Uh, sorry, let me say Mr. Salifo uh, Corey. Mr. Corey is a chief revenue officer at the Ghana Revenue Authority. He has over 20 years of experience in customers' procedures. So he, prom uh, he promotes the integrity within the customer's division in the Ghana Revenue Authority. He has also been leading the agent authority's involvement in the World Customers Organization's anti-corruption and integrity promotion program. So our next panelist is Ms. Brooke, um, Ms. Brooke Stan Lawson. <laughs> she is a experimentation, innovation, and the leaning teed lead at the anti-corruption centers of U.S. Agency for International Development. She leads the team to work on countering transnational corruption and also the anti-corruption center's uh, analytical agenda, monitoring evaluation, and the private sector engagement. She also has uh, quite a few other posts and had has uh, the work experience in international development, uh, relief, reconstruction. So welcome also. So our um, another panelist is Mr. Marcelo uh, Pontis Viana. So he is a secretary for the private sector uh, integrity at the Office of the Controller General of Brazil. He is in charge of enforcing Brazilian Clean Companies Act and is regulating uh, the standards of integrity and the compliance in the private sector. During 2024, Mr. Um, Viana also acts as the chair of the anti-corruption working group of G20. 
He also held other posts in the past, such as a federal auditor and a deputy federal inspector general. So with this, um, I'm very pleased to finalize the introduction. Uh, meanwhile, before the floor is given to our uh, panelists, I would also like to mention that uh, after the intervention and the inputs from panelists, we will have a special session for questions and answers. So now uh, it's my pleasure to invite our panelist Isabel to make in, uh, inputs. So Isabel, could you please share us some examples as for anti-corruption agency, um, how the agency effectively engages the private sector in the prevention of corruption? Yes, and thank you for inviting me to, to this conference, and uh, uh, I also want to pay tribute to Mrs. Finner. I didn't have the, the, the pleasure to, to meet her before, uh, because I already only arrived uh, last, uh, last summer. We exchanged some emails to prepare this conference, but I know that she was an extraordinary person, and I also want to, to share uh, the, 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 all the solidarity of my agency with, uh, with the, the Basel Institute, with whom we have excellent relations for a long time. Uh, I think the best way to, to continue Mrs. Fenner's activities is to be here together today uh, and to answer your question. Uh, so, well, the, the AFA uh, has been created um, by, uh, by, the, by a law in uh, 2016 in France, the Loi Sapin II. And uh, it's a very specific example of how the legislation can really push uh, for uh, companies to uh, introduce anti-corruption measure in, in a right way. Uh, we, the, the French law creates an obligation for major companies, major that means uh, companies which, are, which have more than 50, uh, 500 employees and uh, an annual turnover of more than 100 million euros, so this is already big companies. And in France, all those big companies have the obligation to create effective uh, mechanism for preventing and detecting corruption. And this is really specified in the law what they have to do. Um, they have to comply with eight obligations. Uh, they have to implement eight types of measures to prevent corruption. This is risk mapping because if you want to prevent corruption, you have to know where are your risks, and then um, a number of uh, remedies uh, from a code of conduct, a training system, third-party due diligence, an alert system to allow people to alert when they find something in the company, internal control procedures, uh, disciplinary rules to sanctions, etc. And uh, so this is an obligation that all big companies have to implement. And the law has also created an agency to ensure that big companies are uh, respecting this obligation. So the, national, the French National uh, Anti-Corruption Agency, AFA, uh, Agence Française Anti-Corruption, from which I'm the director, uh, has been created precisely to monitor this obligation by, by companies. So it's a, it's a very demanding uh, system uh, because companies have to implement this obligation independently from the search or committing of any offenses. It's really a preventive system which is mandatory and which is monitored by my agency. So, um, we, we, we see whether companies respect this obligation, and more generally, uh, AFA's mission is to support public and private entities in preventing and detecting corruption and related offenses. So what do we do in, in AFA? Our mission is really to prevention. So we, we want 
to support private companies in implementing this anti-corruption program. In order to do that, we have developed a series of guidelines, uh, recommendations, in order to explain what the law is asking. We have written a series of guides. You can find them on our website. They are both in French and in English. Uh, just to detail some of the risks companies might face, either depending of the area where the company is working. For example, we have recently published a guide on sport because we were pre preparing the Olympic Games in France and we wanted to ensure that all the sports sector will be safe from corruption. Um, we have um, se several guides. We recently published also a guide on presence and invitation. Another one on um, on uh, sponsoring uh, in order to help companies to really prevent corruption and see how they can uh, continue their activities, but in a way that would avoid any kind of, uh, of corruption and would provide sufficient transparency. Uh, we also uh, published a lot of materials, for example, very soon um, we, we, we have had a MOOC um, and uh, we are also um, uh, preparing some uh, uh, audio materials and video which can be uh, found on our um, website. We also conduct survey to see how companies can uh, implement their obligation and what kind of difficulties they face. So we work work in a way that uh, hand in hand with company so that of course we impose them obligation but we work with them in order to facilitate the implementation of those obligations. Um, we uh, regularly con conduct audits on companies to see how they fulfill their obligation on implementing such compliance program. Um, it's very specific audits. We really go in depth in the system of the company. What we want to avoid is uh, ticking the box uh, compliance program. Uh, we want to ensure that in particularly when a company uh, has a program, the, the the risk map really is um, uh, adapted to the companies, to the real risk that the company is facing, and uh, we go quite in depth in the uh, examination of uh, the compliance program that the company has put in place. Um, we also, uh, what we do very often is that we, we uh, conduct an audit on a company and two or three years later, we come back to see if uh, there are progress. And indeed, uh, what we have found in, in five years, in seven years, because now it's already seven years that we work, is that company have really improved. Uh, they, they now consider uh, that those compliance programs are a real progress for them. Not all of them, of course, but most of them have now implemented robust compliance program. Um, and in, in, in the time, they have improved. And when we, we go again to the company, we can uh, see that there are real improvements. Um, this, this, uh, we also work with uh, the prosecution office because um, we have created in France something uh, which is like the uh, deferred um, prosecution agreement which exists in the UK and in the, U in the US. And we have also such a system in France and AFA, uh, when, uh, when a company um, uh, agrees on a settlement uh, with the with the prosecutor, uh, we will we will be the one who monitor um, the implementation of an anti-corruption program um, in those companies. We have now monitored something like 12 uh, such programs, and again, it is a way to see that company can really make progress in in the time. So um, after seven years, what I can say is that it works. 
it works. Uh, and uh, we have seen real improvement. Not everything is perfect, of course, but companies have now accepted this system. They also see that they have an interest to inter enter into, into such comp compliance program because it protects them. Of course, many times when I, I am with companies, they say that it's not always easy to convince uh, the direction of a compliance of a, of a company to enter in such a program because it takes time, it costs money. But also, what is very interesting is that some companies now tell us that uh, such programs have helped them to improve not only regarding compliance, but also their old processes, uh, because they have better relation with their clients, they have no, not so many intermediaries, for example, so they have better relation with their clients. Um, they have also improved their images, um, and uh, they, uh, they have strengthened their internal processes, because by going to the uh, risk assessment, they have have discovered several risks for integrity, but not only. And so globally, it has helped them to improve, which, which is also a very good message that can be conveyed. Another positive consequence that we have seen is that uh, while well, big companies were some, uh, had to comply with ob this obligation, but it has also has competences with so to smaller companies uh, because uh, some uh, smaller companies now have to develop some anti-corruption program because um, they, they, if they want to, to uh, conduct business with bigger companies which have an obligation of diligence, uh, now smaller companies also have to implement such compliance program. I just have one minute, so I will try to finish quickly. Just a few words on the challenges ahead. One big challenge is to have more country joining the OECD convention, because uh, this convention is really a source of improvement due to the evaluation program. I mean, uh, AFA, the creation of AFA is the result of a very bad report from OECD on France, and one of the reactions after this very bad report was the creation of AFA. So uh, this, this convention, which is now 25 years uh, old, really works and has helped a lot of countries to improve. Um, another challenge ahead is uh, to continue working to get together in promoting um, this, uh, the, the, the relation, the pri private um, public partnership. Uh, we will, uh, we also work with Brazil. We, we are together sharing the G20 uh, this year on corruption. We will have a conference tomorrow in Paris. And uh, this is also a, a subject which is uh, in the middle of our discussion. And maybe uh, the last point I want to stress, because I fully agree with Peter, uh, we, we are at a moment where uh, we have a lot of challenging arrests. But I will sadly add another one, which is uh, organized crime. We can really see now, and we feel that in France, that organized crime is becoming a real challenge. The amount of money that those criminals have, in particular linked with drug trafficking, really push for more corruption. It's, they push on companies, they push on the state, and it's a real danger for all our societies. And uh, in order to protect from those criminal organizations, we really have to work more together, both private and public. Uh, there are excellent examples, for example, in airports or in ports. Uh, the, the port of Rotterdam recently developed some very good uh, uh, public-private um, uh, cooperation in order to fight organized crime and to fight corruption. We are now thinking of doing the same uh, in, um, in France. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to point this challenge because I think it's a real challenge ahead of us and we have to work more together on that. Sorry, I was a bit too long. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Isabel, for sharing this very uh, rich for you know expertise and also um, you know your insights in relation to French uh, practice in ensuring or enhancing the company's integrity uh, compliance and also the anti-corruption uh, agency's missions. And thank you very much also mentioning the big challenges, including the linkage between corruption and other types of crime, and the importance of the international cooperation. Thank you very much. So in this regard, I would like to now turn to Salifu, uh, because the Ghana, um, Ghana Revenue Authority is leading an innovative collective action initiatives in the partnership with the World Customs Organization, a kind of international cooperation. So could you please share us with um, your experience and the role of authority in these initiatives? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Distinguished guest. The Ghana Revenue Authority is a partner administration of the World Customs Organization. The Ghana Revenue Authority became one of the first partner administrations to join the World Customs Administration's Anti-Corruption and Integrity Promotion Program. This was in 2018 and declared the intention to introduce new measures in line with the revised Arusha Declaration to combat corruption and promote integrity. Under this program, two customs perception, integrity perception surveys were conducted. And the findings of these surveys reveal that the key factors of audit and investigation and relationship with the private sector were the weakest links within the 10 factors of the revised Arusha Declaration. This therefore emphasized the need to strengthen the internal control mechanisms and to engage more with the private sector. The Ghana Revenue Authority therefore came together with its key partners to discuss how to combat corruption and promote integrity. What were the objectives of Ghana's collective action event? One was to deepen cooperation to deepen cohesion and to build synergies among different stakeholders to support integrity. Two was to promote integrity, not only in customs, but for stakeholders who care about fostering an ethical, positive work and business environment. And the other was to enhance integrity and professionalism, not only in customs, but in cooperation with key stakeholders. Why did the Ghana Revenue Authority embark upon collective action to promote integrity? It is to bring different stakeholders together to fight towards a common goal. And who are the stakeholders in this collective action? The stakeholders include the Ghana Integrity Initiative, which is a civil society organization and the local chapter of Transparency International. We also have the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, which is the state institution responsible for fighting corruption. Again, we have the Office of the Head of Civil Service, which is also a public sector institution. We have the private sector, 
being represented by a committee of freight forwarders. Last but not the least, we have the academia being represented by the University of Ghana Business School. What was my role in all this? I facilitated the entire process from start to finish, from actions to words. I identified key stakeholders to come together to promote integrity. What were the winning conditions in all this? The buy-in that I got from the leadership of the Ghana Revenue Authority, the tacit support from the World Customs Organization, and the need to achieve the objectives of the revised Arusha Declaration on Integrity and Good Governance, and also the need to reduce the perception of corruption in the Ghana Revenue Authority. And I also have to say the Institute of Basel played a significant role in all this and helped me thank Madame Scarlett, who was our keynote speaker when we organized our collective action event. She demonstrated her expertise in this field, and we are thankful to the Institute and to her in person. We did not do this without challenges. There was a challenge of funding to implement initiatives and reforms. There was a challenge of identifying the right stakeholders. There was also a challenge of dealing with different stakeholders with different interests. In all this, what were some of the messages in building an effective collective action and stakeholder engagement. First and foremost is to secure the buy-in and support from key stakeholders in the modernization and reform of customs procedures. Once you have the buy-in and support of your stakeholders, they feel respected, they feel consulted, and they feel listened to, and they feel that their concerns are incorporated into your procedures and processes. And by so doing, you have voluntary compliance, you have less conflicts and then you spend less time in mitigating conflicts. One other key message in preventing corruption, misconduct, and malpractice is to prevent it than having to deal with it after it has occurred. It was like what they say in the medical field, that it is better to prevent than to cure. Madam Moderator, Collective Action has the opportunity of delivering changes that are beneficial to all parties. And Collective Action specifically identifies and tackles problems that are of mutual benefit to all players. And permit me to conclude by saying that collective action is also made up of two parts. The first part has to do with bringing your stakeholders together to dialogue, which is easier than the action part. Thank you, moderator.
Thank you, fellow panelists. Thank you, distinguished guests. Thank you very much, uh, Salif, to share the concrete experience of the cooperation with these um, uh, international and collective action initiatives from the identifying of stakeholders to be engaged in this process to the role of multi-stakeholders to you know, clarify of the objectives and the implementation. So it's very concrete. Thank you very much. So now we turn to break. So recently, we know that in the past years, USAID has been increasingly focusing on the anti-corruption and also including private sector into strategy. Could you please share uh, with us, you know, some practices of the USAID in this regard? Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you to Basel Institute for the convening uh, and as well as your leadership more broadly in collective action and really shining a light on some of the most promising success stories in this space. You're truly a leader alongside more broadly the Siemens Integrity Initiative. So it's a real honor to be here today. I want to share just a, a three insights on the heels of the International Anti-Corruption Conference last week on private sector engagement in this space <clears throat> and then I'll talk about a little bit about um, the public sector role uh, in incentivizing investing in and institutionalizing collective action with the private sector. So, so the first reflection is, it really struck me last week at IACC that we're no longer talking about whether or how the private sector should be engaged in integrity efforts. I think that there's increased recognition across panels, across thematic areas, across topics, that the private sector has a crucial role to play and that it extends beyond mere compliance and internal looking efforts. And that really came through in this year's IACC. The second, uh, when I was in Vilnius, I had the opportunity to meet with civil society actors on the margins of the conference uh, who were in exile, and they emphasized the, that the private sector can be a bulwark against kleptocracies and autocracies when other voices have been silenced or pushed out of the country. It is often the private sector that can remain, who can continue to demonstrate democratic good governance through their mere business practices and continue to have a voice for civic activism when other voices have been silenced or pushed to the side. So it's important, I think, in that space, uh, in these closing spaces, to really recognize the role that the private sector can and, and does play. And then the third is truly that there is uh, safety and I would say power in numbers. There's much more that can happen um, when there is collective action. People and organizations and entities can be more forward-leaning than if they were a lone voice moving forward. And so we can really see how to advance the needle, particularly as we deal with some of the more pernicious forms of corruption, that having collective action and having a shared voice and a shared forum really can help us move the needle. So I'll speak now a little bit about uh, the public sector role in, in incentivizing, institutionalizing, and investing in collective action. So first, in terms of incentivizing collective action, there, the regulatory and accountability actions that public sector can take can be a driving force and have been a driving force to incentivize private sector's collective action. For example, in 2010, the US Congress passed section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, which mandated that US companies audit and publicly disclose the source of minerals in their supply chain to the Securities and Exchange Commission. US-based companies had a shared interest to come together with each other, with the government, and with the civil society to work together on a path forward on how to comply with this act. Out of this need and shared interest, the Public-Private Alliance for Responsible Minerals Trade, the PPA, a platform for bolstering ethical sourcing of minerals and maximizing benefits to communities where minerals were produced was formed. The PPA demonstrated such clear benefits of this tripartite relationship that it is now on its third memorandum of understanding and it has gone beyond the required disclosures from the SEC to 
expand to cover more than the initial four minerals in the Great Lakes region to cover critical minerals globally and the private sector, civil society, and government continue to work together in this space far beyond the mere regulation requirements that were envisioned. And I just want to underscore that trifecta relationship that's so important of bringing together government, civil society, and private sector. Second, the public sector can provide institutional platforms where collective action can flourish. My fellow panelists have already mentioned some country level examples, so I won't take time focusing on that, but rather we'll talk about uh, a global level action. Country level efforts are absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient, particularly as we face contemporary forms of corruption that transcend borders and involve sophisticated, powerful, and complex networks. The U.S. government is investing in collective action efforts, most notably, as our lightning talk speaker Julia had mentioned, the State Department, Bureau, the State, U.S. State Department's Bureau for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, has launched the global initiative to galvanize the private sector as partners in combating corruption, or more simply, GPS. GPS is a platform to strengthen collective action between the government and business to prevent corruption improve the international business climate, and level the playing field. GPS convenes governments and the business leaders to exchange knowledge, build and disseminate anti-corruption solutions, advance international standards on anti-corruption and integrity, and inform international, regional, and sectoral anti-corruption priorities. Third, the private sector invests its resources, both time and money, into private sector collective action efforts. I'll add a third example of U.S. government investments in private sector to the two I already mentioned, the PPA and GPS, which is near and dear to my heart, as it's the program that I manage. The Countering Transnational, that feels very appropriate. <laughs> the Countering Transnational Corruption Grand Challenge for Development. Uh, it's USAID's first Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance is also the home to USAID's 12th Grand Challenge. It's an inclusive, incubator for new ideas that allow us to experiment with promising solutions to the complex problems of transnational corruption and increase our collective tools that can be tailored for local contexts and integrated into longer-term development programs. The grand challenge and its activities provide an opportunity for the private sector to engage directly with innovators and technical experts, shaping programming and supporting their corporate policies and goals on tackling corruption in key sectors. In some instances, the private sector contributes their time, their energy, their resources to supporting these innovators, such as Amazon joining with BHP Foundation, Chandler Foundation, and USAID to invest in 11 of the most promising solutions to promote transparency and accountability in green mineral supply chains. And in other instances, the private sector directly applies for and receives funding to advance their innovative anti-corruption solutions. For example, uh, companies like Talisman International is, playing an e is piloting an easily accessible free data platform that supports the due diligence in the lithium volume chain in Latin America and the Caribbean. And Pedicazi ASM Consultants is a Malawian small, uh, women-owned small business that is supporting investigative journalism and civic engagement to promote transparency and accountability. Most recently, we received 100 innovative solutions or concepts directly from or in partnership with the private sector under the Doing Business Integ with Integrity Call for Innovations. Over the past several months, we have engaged with applicants and are on the cusp of announcing the 10 innovations that will be awarded grants and in-kind support. Some of these innovators may already be here in the room today, and others will be new to our community. Additional information about each innovation will be announced on a rolling basis over, over the summer. And without giving too much away, I can preview that the solutions cover a wide range of activities from a collective action initiative led jointly by private companies and anti-corruption civil society organizations to identify and discourage social behavior um, that favors transnational bribery in Latin America and the Caribbean region, to acting to scaling an artificial intelligence-assisted data sharing platform for anti-corruption NGOs to provide quality, actionable data to, think to banks, traders, and other private sector entities. And I want to take just a moment to recognize the visionary leadership that Greta brought every day to her work. 
One of my fondest memories from the Conference of State Parties in Atlanta was finding a quiet moment on the margins of it all to listen to Greta talk through a concept on social norms in corporate compliance programs with her characteristic poise, passion, and thoughtfulness. I know I'm just one of the many people upon whom Greta left a lasting impression, and I'm honored to be with her team today, sorry, and to continue this important anti-corruption work together. I look forward to learning more about the work of all of you at this conference and taking back good practices and lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brick, to share so detailed um, experience on what the government is taking to promote the engagement of private sector from the um, legislation to the institutionalization platforms and to networking. So thank you very much. Now we turn to Marcelo. So we know that Brazil is leading the anti-corruption working group at G20 during 2024. So Marcelo, could you please share us more about the uh, Office of the Controller General of Brazil in promoting and enhancing collective action initiatives? Okay, so first of all, good morning to you all. Let me start by thanking for this invitation and also for congratulating uh, the Basel Institute for having incentivizing uh, the discussion among this so important and relevant uh, topic for the past years. As Peter said, and many of the other, my follow, uh, fellow panelists here have also said, recognizing that uh, corruption is a complex problem is also recognized that there is no easy solution to address it. So before I jump to what we have been doing at the G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group, uh, let me talk about the, a little bit about the history of uh, the agents that I work for in Brazil uh, addressing anti-corruption efforts. So CGU, uh, which is the agency that I work for, was established uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. And at first, we were tasked with several uh, duties that were very focusing on uh, public integrity. So we were charged with the duties of overviewing public expenditures, overviewing the effectiveness of public policies, also bringing transparency to public expenditures. Uh, but it didn't take too long to recognize that just addressing the public sector aspect of this uh, problem uh, was not enough. That the private sector uh, played a very significant role also on fighting corruption. It, it's very glad to say, as Brooks said, that nowadays we are past it over this perception and that's well established. But uh, during the mid 20,000s, we start to think how we could address uh, this issue, trying to foster a culture of integrity within the private sector. So uh, the OECD convention played a very important role in that sense for Brazil as well. Brazil is not a permanent member of the OECD, but he uh, has assigned this anti-bribery convention of the OECD. And indeed, the evaluation process of the OECD pushed us to first enact a law that established the uh, liability for legal persons involved in the corruption uh, activity. So my unit nowadays uh, has a significant part of my team is working on investigating and charging companies that are involved with uh, corruption. But even though the law was established by the beginning of 2013, uh, from the beginning we think that uh, sanctioning the company should not be an end in itself. You know, that the liability of companies with corruption should be seen as a tool to an end. And that is to foster a culture of integrity within the private sector. So enforcing sanctions, of course, plays a very significant role, but we also needed to address this issue with other types of approaches. So within the sanctioning procedure uh, itself, we start realizing that companies who had compliance programs in place should be treated differently from the companies who didn't have. So companies who have compliance uh, effective programs 
can ask for diminished sanctions, can also ask for uh, non-trial resolutions agreement as a tool of the government recognizing that those companies should, should be treated differently. But again, treating this problem just from an enforcement perspective was not enough for us. So we also think that the government has a very important role guiding companies on how to set up effective integrated internal programs. So at first we start regulating which were the requirements that we're expecting companies to uh, address in order to have good compliance programs. And then we issued several guidelines trying to give more better concrete understanding what they should, the steps they should take. In. But we also think that we should recognize that this is an effort that should be also rewarded, uh, even if the company is not facing uh, enforcement procedure. So, on the early 2010s, we initiated a program uh, which is now it at, at seven edition, which is called the Proethics Program. And the Proethics Program, it's basically the opportunity that companies can voluntarily submit its uh, integrated programs to be accessed by uh, the government. And the government will establish and recognize the best practice in this field and give awards to the companies so they can publicly uh, display to its business partners, to its clients, to any of the uh, other stakeholders that the government has awarded them, has recognized that they do have a good integrated program. So this program is issued every two years uh, since uh, then, we have seen that each time more companies are looking for this type of recognition, and we use this also as a tool to raise the bar uh, even higher for companies. So we are looking for this program for the best practices. So we are looking after what the market is doing, we look after what other countries are also requiring, and then we put those as requirements to give the award to the companies. Our last edition, uh, we had 255 applicants and 85 companies were awarded uh, in that sense. But we also recognize that even though it's a successful program, it was still not enough uh, in terms of building up the sense that the business sector in Brazil should be more engaged with uh, the culture of integrity. So one of the criticisms that we receive is that the standards for being awarded are very high. And sometimes companies are still not there. So companies, uh, they are still beginning this process of improving their internal programs, and they need support, they need help. So what we did uh, is first to recognize that the government by itself uh, would be not sufficient to provide the support. So we have uh, historically partnered with other organizations, specifically from uh, only, uh, NGOs and civil society organizations who are also doing a very good, good job on, in that sense. So I would just to highlight two here. Uh, Alliance for Integrity has been a great partner, and specifically the work that has been done by the Global Compact, the UN Global Compact, it's superb in Brazil, and we are very proud to join them and work together in that sense. Uh, but answering to, do, to this criticism, we launched a new uh, program last year, which is called the Brazilian uh, Pact for Business Integrity. So this is a collective action that is provided by the government, and it basically it's saying to companies, make a public statement that your company is committed with those uh, integrity standards. Uh, in return, what we provide them is the ability to access an uh, electronic platform that we developed where the companies can self-access them themselves. So they will have an access to a questionnaire that was developed by, our, by CGU, and then the company can see where it stands, where they can improve, and what gaps they need to address. But we, and of course, the company can say and can use the mark of the pact 
as also something that brings value to its uh, brand. But we believe that the government can also play other different roles. So government should be giving different benefits for companies who have compliance requirements under public procurement procedures and also when deciding which companies are going to receive public subsidies or company financing. So we are regulating uh, the Brazilian procurement law in order to state that companies who have integrated internal programs, they will have a preference on signing contracts with the Brazilian government. The same will also uh, happen to the public official uh, financial institutions who provides a lot of funds to the private sector. And when deciding which company is going to receive these funds, companies with integrated programs uh, we will have also a benefit, we will also have a better position to ask for these funds. And in a nutshell, that's how we think that government should be approaching this challenge of fostering a culture of integrity within the private sector. And that's what we are trying to bring for the International Forum. So last year's COSP at Atlanta, uh, the Brazilian delegation has successfully proposed a resolution and which was adopted by the, the plenary of the convention, uh, saying under the resolution that the government should not leave to the private sector itself to deal with integrity, but the government has a very important role improving and fostering and encouraging companies to do that. And that's the same approach that we are doing, trying to do in the G20 this year. With just a minor, uh, but not a minor, but actually it's a minor, but very fundamental uh, component that we want to add to the G20. So to wrap up my speak here, at the G20, other than saying that the government play a very important role fostering private sector integrity, we want to take this opportunity to broad the concept of integrity. Uh, so historically, integrity uh, within the private sector has been very focusing on preventing anti-corruption, but we think that it should be a broader concept, that integrity is not only about uh, fighting corruption, preventing corruption, but it's also about dealing with sustainability, it's about the role of governments, of the companies, and their social function that they play within the society they are uh, inside. So that's one of the biggest challenge now, is to address uh, all the countries that are part of the G20, so that we can share the same perception of what should be the role of the private sector, and what's the concept of integrity. And we hope that by the end of the year, we will have a good and strong document uh, establishing this, uh, not only for the G20 members, but for all the other countries in the world. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Marcelo, to share your um, experience and also, you know, your insights. So, I, I, I fully agree that, um, as what you mentioned just now, the public sector does not only have the role to effect, to enact law, but also guide the implementation of the law. And I also think you made a very uh, important point that about the two ways or two manners to facilitate the business integrity, not only sanction, but also incentives. Um, and also thank you very much for sharing a hot topic probably at anti-corruption working group in, uh, of G20 is relating to the broad context, concept of integrity. Thank you very much. So, firstly, I would really thank you, uh, thank all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, you not only shared your invaluable expertise and insights, but also you are so good at management of time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not easy to, you know, simplify your large amount of knowledge into very simple words within limited time. Thank you very much. Um, 
I would also like to have follow-up questions to our distinguished panelists. To for uh, Isabel, you shared the measures taken by the anti-corruption agency in France to increase the business uh, integrity. But how could the public sector ensure the relevance of these measures along the involvement of situation? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, thank you for the question. As I <laughs> mentioned, we, 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 we continue to audit um, companies uh, in the time uh, to see whether they have implemented the uh, good compliance program. I just wanted to, to share uh, with Marcello because uh, he, he says that he has, they, they published some kind of guidelines for companies so that companies can check themselves mm -hmm. whether they, they have, uh, whether they, the, the, the quality of their compliance program. We have something which is a bit similar because we publish regular, regularly the, um, the, the way we will audit them. So we, we have a lot of questions. It, it's really uh, strong. It's something like 150 questions. So it goes really in depth. And the company can test their own system by looking at, at this questionnaire, even if they are not controlled. But uh, it's used very precisely to check whether their compliance system is, is okay. And uh, so, because th that way we can continue uh, working with them at time. And once we have been auditing a company, we continue to work with this company two years, three years later. Um, and uh, we, we have regular relations. So we, we don't just audit them, but we accompany them. And by the way, we do the same with the public sector. Uh, the difference is that for private company, if they do not respect the law, they can be fined. So we, we have a sanction capacity, uh, which is not the, 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 which is not in place for public sector. But that's what we do in order to, to, to work with them during the time. And really, it works. It, it has improved. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Salifu. Um, in the cooperation between the national agencies and the international cooperation of uh, partners from you know, regional or international organizations, there is always a challenge to sustain the outcome or achievements of these joint initiatives or cooperation. So how did your initiative in the partnership with uh, world customers organizations uh, to sustain or to ensure the outcomes of the initiative sustained even after the closure of a specific program. Thank, Thank you. you. The collective action initiative within the GRA has built a coalition of stakeholders to support integrity and already we are reaping the benefits of this coalition. Our image has been enhanced. We have recorded significant improvements in revenue and the time and cost of doing business has also reduced. Now to the point of sustaining it at the end of the program, we are already negotiating with the Ghana Integrity Initiative to support us in this direction. Let me also use this opportunity to say we have a common reporting, corruption reporting mechanism with them. But it is really a challenge to sustain it and we hope that we would be able to overcome it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Baruch, could you also share some um, uh, your, your insights on the key contributors to a su successful programs, as you mentioned in your uh, intervention? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, I think 
as we're thinking about collective action, I think um, one which I hit on a little bit, which I can't underscore enough, is really the value of the of the tripartite relationship, where you're bringing civil society, government, and the private sector together uh, to play a role. So I think that's that's certainly one. Um, I think that the second that that we've really emphasized is understanding and aligning incentives. Um, none of this is rocket science. What I'm saying, but these are these are the key takeaways, which is which is really taking the time up front to understand the political economy in which you're operating and the incentives of different actors to find those touch points where there's alignment that will allow you inroads to be able to to move forward with your programming so i think i'll just those are the two i think that i would emphasize the most thank you thank you very much marcelo one a follow-up question to you uh, could you please share your insights on uh, what the private sector or how the pro uh, pro private sector could actively and uh, you know effectively contribute to the collective action? Well, uh, it's it's very important to recognize that uh, if it's only the government pushing. Uh, integrity efforts, it, it won't be enough, you know? So uh, we have seen that since we enacted the Clean Companies Act in Brazil, there was a huge trend among companies to realize that they needed to have uh, better internal uh, procedures, they have better uh, risk management systems, and it only was possible uh, because companies collectively uh, recognize that was a movement that they need to do together. It wouldn't be uh, sufficient if we only had companies doing that once they are sanctioned, once they were audited, or things like that. So it's very uh, rewarding to see that we do have a very large uh, business community in Brazil which is very much engaged with that. Once again, it's very important to highlight uh, initiatives that were taken by the civil society organization. Uh, we have not only the Global Compact uh, Unit in Brazil, which is very large and successful initiative, but we also have some uh, domestic uh, initiatives that were taken by NGOs who have su su successfully brought together uh, different companies from different sectors, uh, stating that it's good for the business. So I think the, the best challenge and the best uh, thing that the private sector can contribute uh, to foster the culture of integrity is displaying that this is good for the business. You know, it's not only about setting up rules and making business harder. Yeah. It's actually that it's worth having uh, this type of behavior because it will give you more access to good stakeholders, better partnerships uh, with other business uh, partners, and in the long road, uh, doing the right thing will make you have a more profitable business. Yeah. And just to uh, address how important it is to have in the same room uh, people from different countries, from different backgrounds, but also people who come from the private and the public sector. For instance, we have uh, been inspired a lot by the work that France does, issuing those guidelines. We have seen those and we are also trying to work something uh, that resembles the work that France does. Uh, also, the audit process is something that we want to state uh, under companies that have public contracts and have benefit from the privilege of having a compliance program and then being rewarded in public procurements, those companies are going to be subjected to audits and we want to learn how, how France uh, does it uh, as well. So uh, it wouldn't be sufficient in words to stress how important the private sector to do this. So I think that's it. Thank you, thank you so much. So with this, we will open the floor for questions. Um, when you give, are given the floor, please identify your name, your country organization, and the panelists to which you will address. Uh, due to the time limits, we may only give the floor to two distinguished participants. And then we will have the coffee break, so I think distinguished participants can approach our panelists for further discussion. Sorry, thank you very much. Yes, please. 
So first of all, congratulations. I'm Rinaldo Goto, Chief Compliance Officer from BRF and also Project Manager of B20. Mm -hmm. My question goes to Marcela and also to Isabel as co-chair of the G20. Uh, uh, what could be, I mean, the, the, the main new uh, commitments from the G20 countries regarding the collective actions and also as Peter mentioned, we are facing a very challenging moments uh, across the world uh, for due to political reasons. Yeah, uh, what do you see as some challenges or some blocking points that could uh, 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 struggle or could restrict the adoptions of new uh, uh, measures related to collective actions in the G20 countries? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll try to be very uh, brief on that, but very objective. Is so what we are trying to do under the document, which is called uh, High Level Principles on Fostering uh, Integrity in the Private Sector, is to establish a series of uh, steps that government needs to do in order to encourage the private sector to adopt integrated systems. And among those lines, one thing that's very important for us is that governments recognize the relevance of collective actions. And that is one of the challenges that we do have because it's not all, it's not all the countries that, realize, that are, have realized that yet. So we do uh, recognize that countries have different backgrounds, different historical uh, systems. And one of the things that's giving the hard time for me is to sensibilize those countries to put in paper and to sign with us, recognize that government should support collective actions. And well, we hope that we can be successful uh, with that by the end of the year. No, not, not much to add, actually. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, just I, I, I fully share. Uh, we it's very important that that uh, governments enter and recognize this this importance. Uh, what we also think, but it's a bit out of G20. Uh, we we are also engaged in the European Union in trying to push the EU in this direction to have a very strong anti-corruption program. And among that, we would like to have. European European guidelines uh, for companies on how to push uh, for, on, for real and, and practical anti-corruption program so that there are some kind of standards that could be shared at international level on uh, what, how company could enter into such program and implement them. This lady, okay, yeah, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Svi Bekilusan Laravag. I'm from um, the private sector. And when you talk about the private sector, the private sector is wide. So my question is, how do you make sure that the SME is included in the incentives or in the work that you do, especially when it comes to what are the requirements and how do you educate them on the path? Um, ex excuse me, probably I meet some part to which uh, panelist would you like your question to? It can be open, but I think, Marcelo, you would probably be the first one I would like to say. How will okay. the government react to this? <laughs> Thank you very much. Because of the time limits, if okay. I may, could... Uh, of course, yeah. No, that, that's a great question. So, yeah. for instance, like in, uh, for the Brazilian experience, mm -hmm. I think among 95% of the business in Brazil are composed by SMEs. So that's really relevant for us to treat the requirements that we have for big companies differently from the one that we stand for SMEs. One thing that's helpful back in Brazil is that we do have, um, it's, it's kind of a governmental institution which is tasked only to support SMEs in Brazil. So we have partnered with them for several years that we establish different guidelines, different requirements for SMEs. Uh, and that has been also a point of concern under the G20 uh, document that we are drafting. It's not only Brazil, but several other countries uh, said that we need to highlight the importance to treat differently SMEs from big companies, mm -hmm. especially to not prevent the development of new business uh, due to uh, compliance requirements. So that's a concern that we uh, try to address all the time, but it's a challenging because we don't want to put uh, too much requirements, but at some point we don't want to put too few that doesn't make sense. 
but it's a very relevant point for us. Okay. Thanks. Yes, please, Brooke. Just to add briefly to that, I think it's a very important question, and one of the components of the galvanizing the private sector, Julia, I'm going to steal all your thunder and ignore, but uh, one of the other, um, one of the components of that is also um, providing a space where larger companies can provide technical assistance and support to small and medium enterprises that are struggling with regulations, share some good practices, and help them streamline that process. If I had, can add something else, um, um, what, what we have seen is that because big companies have to implement big program, uh, they also have um, created um, contract clauses. So uh, through the contract clauses, smaller company also have to improve because if they want to, to have business with bigger company, they have also to, to take this into consideration. But, but of course, they don't have the capacity to do such big and exigent programs. So what, what we do is helping them by providing some uh, um, tailor-made uh, program for them which are easier to implement and we also have all kinds of um, uh, specific uh, tools uh, like podcasts that uh, can explain them what to do uh, in a concrete level to implement a program if you are an SME. But you are fully right. This is a key of key importance because at, at the daily, on the daily basis, smaller companies are the ones who are uh, doing a lot of business. Thank you very much for the further uh, expertise. I saw the hands up, but I'm very sorry. We got one, okay. one more, please. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Max Amanu. I'm from UNODC Integrity Advisory Board, member of the, the Youth-Led Integrity Advisory Board. Uh, I'm actually glad that uh, I, was, I, I got this opportunity to bring this up. It's more of an appeal than a question. Uh, I would like to introduce a new actor into the uh, collective action uh, initiatives. So I had, uh, of course, from the previous uh, uh, speeches of actors involved in the collective action, and it's not a secret that uh, private sector is the biggest employer of uh, uh, worldwide, and we have a new wave of uh, uh, generation, a young generation, the biggest uh, 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 in history, and uh, I would like to appeal not only to the panelists, but also to the people in the room that uh, let's catch these souls, the young generation, as we talk about like Mr. Saifu highlighted before, that we need to prevent than to allow uh, uh, corruption happen. So let's use our companies, our platforms to educate, to uh, encourage, and to, to build capacity of the next generation leaders who are of high integrity and also because it's beneficial to not only for us, but also in the prevention mechanism. And I think I would just ask uh, uh, Ms. Isabel and uh, if there are other, any initiatives uh, uh, you are involved in from the uh, French anti-corruption agency that's involved the, uh, the young generation in promoting integrity and of course in the fight against corruption. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question to um, fill a puzzle on the engagement of youth. Thank you. No, I, I think you're, you're right, but uh, it's uh, young people have a, have a key role to play in order to uh, to say no. I would say this is the point. Uh, I've been uh, I've been discussing with a lot of companies, um, and they all said that at one time it is their responsibility to say no to corruption, uh, and uh, at. At, at sometimes it's a question of courage and it's a question of involvement. And well, you also have to say that, and young people may have a role in, in, in this area also to say, well, sometimes you have to say no. Uh, and uh, um, 
And it's more, sometimes more difficult for smaller companies, by the way, because if you are big companies, I, I recently had, uh, was on a panel with Amazon. If you are Amazon, uh, well, you can say no. <laughs> it, it's easy. If you're a smaller company, sometimes it's more difficult because, well, it can be a question of life or death for the company. And that's where having the public, uh, the, 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 the civil society and the young people in the civil society involved to say, well, uh, we say no, and I say that I say no. Uh, and it can also bring people with you and, and give you more strength. Thank you very much. So in the time of uh, interest, we have to wrap up. Um, but I would also like to bring attention on resources available. So just now, Julia also mentioned the anti-bribery uh, anti convention and the you know, uh, recommendations. In addition to that, we have a lot of resources available for you to make reference. For example, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, it indeed provides the measures on the participation of society. And also, the U United Nations Global Compact published a publication called A Playbook on Anti-Corruption um, Collective Action. So they are all available on the website. So at the end, allow me to thank all the uh, distinguished panelists for their inputs and thank the participants for your attendance and also questions. And also thank the Basel Institute of Governance to organize this uh, meeting with support of Siemens. Thank you. Thank you.